something really nice the colleague mentioned was the wall which was built. And what comes to our mind when we hear wall is a Chinese wall. And that's exactly where we'd like to shift our debate at this point. Again, talk about world economy and not only about Sweden or specific countries in Europe, but rather have a broader view on this whole issue. And then we want to highlight emerging markets, which in 2008 were still highly dependent on exports to those other countries. So what we saw in 2008 was, as a consequence of those low interest rates, was an increase in foreign direct investment. Obviously, because so much money was put on the market that that money then was invested in Asia, in those emerging markets. And that was very much needed, because in 2008, those countries weren't yet ready for a credit crunch. Because, for example, in China, in 2008, we still had a dependency on export at about 28%, whereas now, in 2015, we have that dependency down to 22%. So we see now, because they're less dependent on those other markets, on those foreign markets, they are more independent, more stable to deal with those increasing interest rates, which we might face in next years, but they weren't able to in 2008. Um, you said the broader issue, and this is the question I was going to pose you. Um, today and even three years ago, how would you solve secular stagnation? Probably respond to the statement given that we would very much like to respond to the question, but we would prefer that the counter arguing period is spent with counter arguing period, and then we can take the questions during the question period. Is that well, this is my counter argument? How would you, if you have any? No, you respond. You don't get counter argument now. Counter. Okay, oh, fine. Yeah. fine, 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 fine. Let me argue. You can't. Monetary policy cannot solve these issues. If you go, the Wixellian natural rate is negative. If you if you go negative, that can have um, <laughs> adverse effects on savings. Cash has cash starts having a real interest rate, a real return. So what you end up doing is you end up actually encouraging cash savings. Now all this is theoretical. We've never been in negative interest rates, and hopefully we never have to. But given the given the the state of the economy right now, monetary policy cannot solve this problem. And maybe it can if you continue this policy for another ten years. But thank you very much. We completely agree. Monetary policies can't solve this problem alone. But thank God the monetary policies stabilized employment levels and stabilized the economy back in 2008 because this actually enabled EU, US to, to make some of these essential structural reforms, which are so central for these things not to happen. These, when we're talking this, we're talking employer employer reforms on hiring, how easy it is to hire and fire, how flexible the labor market is. This is something the EU Commission looks very deeply into because these are the exact policies which will help our economy develop. Also, we said about speculations. We agree that that's an absolute problem. We agree that there is a housing pricing problem faced right now in Europe. But imagine back in 2008, we would have not had those measures which would decrease unemployment, which would increase productivity and increase demand. We would have never been able to implement any underlying structures, fundamental structures, changes, which then allow us to fight speculations. I'm going to have to stop you there. We're going to have to move on to questions. Um, we'll start off with the judges, if that's OK. Just like to use a specific example to answer your question. 
Um, in April 2015, the Australian Reserve Bank, uh, in their financial stability review, um, primarily concentrated on the responses to risks in the housing and mortgage market, and that the very low interest rates and fast rising house prices will lead to an oversupply in certain areas, and this will, quote, inevitably lead to a perhaps dramatic fall in prices. Yeah, so for example, to, to make it a bit easier um, conceptually, um, the house prices are fueled obviously by cheaper mortgage, mortgages um, in combination to some of the uh, policies that were implemented in some of the countries, such as buy to let. So the combination of low interest rates, which give low, um, very low interest rates on mortgages, combined with new policies, um, uh, you know, fueled the uh, asset bubble in housing. Um, in equities, it's a bit more complicated. Um, it's mostly because of um, low risk um, financial instruments having lower yield because of um, lower uh, government bond yields. So investors have to go into uh, more risky um, investments, um, such as equities. Um, and I think there's an, um, uh, and yeah, P2P lending as well was one example that we didn't I'll just like to use the example of um, yield searching. P2P lending just in last year alone increased by 140%. Um, investors are attracted to higher returns offered by this a very unregulated market. Um, this reminds me personally of the collateralized um, markets that were developing pre-2008. Uh, much of this is unregulated. There's very little due diligence done um, when investors directly invest in peer-to-peer um, -peer platforms with, the le with their lenders. Um, and much of this is because of the um, yield searching. Yeah, and, and most of the causal, um, causal relations were established in, in the reports we quoted, so Moody's report, etc. Um, so if I understand your question correctly, you're asking when cutting interest rates will be a good tool when it's complementary to other tools. Uh, interest rates themselves are a good tool because we, you'd expect aggregate consumption to rise if interest rates are low because of uh, how yeah. consumers and businesses can borrow more cheaply in the present period rather than later on. Um, and they talked about how this enables mortgages and asset bubbles. That's only one side of the coin. It also enables businesses with cash flow issues, as you would expect when demand falls, to keep going and maintain employment. So that's one of the benefits of cutting interest rates from the central bank perspective. Um, it's complementary for other monetary tools, other monetary tools, um, because as I explained uh, earlier in the debate, that um, higher interest rates um, amplify; they multiply government spending. So through QE, for example, by increasingly positive uh, signs when uh, they're low. So the New York Federal Bank said that uh, they saw that at near zero interest rates, government spending had multiplied about eight times the effect as QE. And to, to complement that, when is it e effective as part of a solution? Well, it's effective because we see that the likelihood of structural reforms and policymakers actually out in, the, in democratic institutions succeeding is higher when we have a lower unemployment. So that means that many of these structural reforms wouldn't have been possible to make if the employment had, had continued to, to fall. And, uh, and without this monetary tool, which we've seen it as very, very effective, that could have taken 15, 20 years until stabilizing. That's simply not enough time when we know that, uh, that reforms like Basel III, which is uh, an agreement that, uh, that demands that at least 3% of uh, the equities hold by, by banks um, to, uh, to decrease risk, uh, risk management. Yeah, in the US, the, 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 counter, the counter version is on 5%. Uh, I'm just cautious of time, I think we'll move yep. on to the next question, if that's right. Okay, I'll ask a couple of questions, kind of developing on what you said. Um, just thinking about the way, if you're for this, uh, motion you presumably would like to see interest rates already risen or rising now and I'm just put into and you say that um, uh, if, if, if you can think of uh, uh, so I want you to think through the mechanism uh, there exactly what, what happens um, at that point um, when you're in a recession uh, how does monetary policy really work and if you're reversing this interest rate <laughs> Drop to an increase of rate. I put it to you that in fact all that does really is um, is is just uh, have an income effect. It takes income out of the hands of businesses and uh, households, and 
it would be in fact no different from our fiscal stimulus in that sense. So, I, I, you know, I, I, I think in a recession, some of the ideas you have for, for how interest rate works is looking perhaps not, uh, not, not uh, I'd like you to be more explicit there about uh, that. On the other side, um, uh, I'd like to push you a bit more on, um, on, on, on zero. Um, why, why not go negative? What is, what is it? What's your argument about why haven't we gone negative? What is it about zero? Uh, that if you like zero, why not negative? And then to both of you, um, if you started with the problem in the world economy. Uh, uh, are either of these policies really, it, it seems to me it's a productivity problem that we're facing. And um, I'd like a quick response on whether you think uh, either of these two fiscal debaters really got anything to say about the detrimental state of the world economy, or um, uh, it, is it, it, is it that these policy, this policy debate you're having has got anything to say about uh, productivity growth? Fiscal stimulus has less negative effects um, than the equivalent monetary uh, stimulus, assuming they're both equal in their benefits for the economy. Um, Japan, I'd like to use Japan as an example. It, had, it's, it's, it has had zero interest rates since the 90s, um, and it's still stuck in this deflationary trap. Um, we're seeing some improvement with economics, and much of the change has come through fiscal um, stimulus, through fiscal improvements, um, as well as structural changes. Um, and as far as the productivity problem, yeah, we really believe that um, fiscal stimulus could enhance productivity. Um, and um, as it will, will incentivize workers to work harder and um, to get more from, from the work. And yeah. It would invest as well in technology, um, infrastructure. Um, one of the biggest criticisms of fiscal policy is that um, it's unsustainable, right? Um, we also argue that it should be counter cyclical, much like monetary policy, deficits in good times, um, uh, deficits in bad times, surpluses in good times. But given the current environment, um, in particular, it's worth, worth uh, mentioning that um, US Treasury bonds have been on average lower since the end of QE than they have been during QE, uh, which just shows that investors' trust doesn't change no matter the monetary, um, the monetary condition. Uh, and to go back to productivity, I'd say um, you know, we argue for a um, that the environment right now is essentially a liquidity trap in 75, 80% of the countries. And in a liquidity trap, you know, you won't raise productivity through monetary stimulus. You have to use fiscal policies, such as increased spending in education, in uh, investment in technologies, in research, those things. You, know, you could do them, in theory, with monetary stimulus, but not in a liquidity trap, when the demand for liquidity is so high that it doesn't circulate back into the economy. I'm going to stop you there. Again, what we saw, so first of all, I'm going to answer also to that um, productivity point before I hand it to my colleague. Um, what we've seen is that those fiscal stimulus are enhanced and are strengthened through the, monetary through the monetary stimulus. So we see that we've got a lot of money, a lot of liquidity on the market, which then can be invested by investors or companies into research, into development, etc. However, we believe that those are rather long-term effects, but we also want to talk about a very, very um, evident short-term effect, because the alternative what they suggest would be high unemployment rates. Because what we saw through that low, those low interest rates was that unemployment effectively went down in the US from 10% in 2010, within two or three years down to 6%. That was all part of those low interest rates. And what comes with long-term unemployment, which that definitely classifies for, is lower productivity after that unemployment rate. Obviously, because workers are not trained, are not up to date, might find work in different areas. So we saw that you know, through keeping employment high, we could at the same time then increase the productivity because we wouldn't let those workers into long-term unemployment. So you, you asked the interesting question of zero effect balance, essentially. Um, well, no one really knows why not. It could go lower. There's a there's Dutch economist who I read recently about, uh, Willem Boots, I think, who's written a lot about negative interest rates. Um, and in fact, we have seen them in the world. Denmark is one example of negative interest rates interest rates. One kind of counter argument, a very common one, is that um, because we still use hard currency essentially, 
what people will do is just convert all their money into hard currency and then they wouldn't lose their money. But that doesn't necessarily mean they lose consumption either. So it might not be as effective as a tool as some people think. Uh, yeah, we'll one question. Final quick question. So you talked a lot about cost and benefit analysis, and it's actually quite tricky to decide what goes into a deep kind of cost and benefit ana analysis and what one comes up with. So um, every policy change comes with a, a some sort of redis redistribution, some implications on redistribution. So in, for both parties, in your view, who are the who is the main winner of a low interest rate policy? Who is the main loser of an interest rate policy in terms of redistribution of, 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 of wealth and possibilities? And is that something which supports your where you stand, or is that something which which makes your your argument weaker? Start Very things up. We'll start with you guys. Um, one of the key distributional effects of lower rates is to boost asset values. Um, it's to reduce pensions, annuities, interest, and savings, and other like income payments. Um, they do reduce mortgage payments as well, interest as well in other areas as well. Um, so one of the distributional outcomes of zero interest rates is in fact to increase inequality. Um, however, um, one of the other key distributional effects of low rates is the simulation of job creation by keep maintaining employment. And, and we also argue that structural forms, such as the fiscal policy proposition that's been so busy advocating, can be used to redistribute. But at the same time, we need monetary policy for the other more positive effects it creates. Well, we're responding to your question. Monetary policy, in my opinion, has more of a short-term effect on inequality. Um, it does raise asset prices, and you can argue that it's the rich who own assets, so they benefit. But at the same time, it lowers interest rates. So the rich earn less interest on their cash, on their savings. Um, so essentially, an argument that I've heard is that eventually, after rates normalize, these effects are balanced out. Um, on the other hand, what we're proposing in terms of fiscal policy, much of that benefit goes to the um, lower income, lower 50% of the uh, population. Um, and I would just like to reply to something you said about lowering interest rates in 2008. Uh, very short. Again, we're not arguing about 2008. We're talking about the last few years. Um, no, I, well, I, I think that the motion was have near zero interest rate been detrimental to the world economy? Well, we're not 1930-style deflationary oh, economy. Nice. Based. We'll yeah. stop it on that and uh, move on to the concluding speeches, if that's all right. Thanks. So, as we have seen previously, near zero interest rates was a real necessity when the 2008 financial crisis occurred. Fine. This being said, for the last few years, they are more harmful than beneficial to the global economy in many aspects. The most obvious effect of this cheap money po policy is that it creates and enhances bubbles, especially in the housing and equity market. Moreover, cheap money combined with yield-seeking behavior only enhances and incentivize investors to unwillingly invest with increasing risk. This phenomenon can be easily observed as mortgage-backed securities, such as the famous CDOs, are making an amazing comeback on the financial scene, fueled by rising housing costs. Equities have also massively appreciated during the last eight years. Another noticeable effect of low interest rates is secular stagnation. The essence of secular stagnation is a chronic excess of saving over investment. Secular stagnation holds that a combination of higher rates of saving, lower investment, and increased risk aversion. The actual rates increase savings through cash holding rather than the opposite effect. It's meant to have post-quantitative um, post easing has run to diminishing return. As investors are forced to seek uh, riskier investment um, but remain at the same time risk averse, they purchase more and more complex investments and instruments, uh, reminiscent of 2008 derivatives. Oof. However, most of the world economy is stuck in a liquidity trap. As such, what is truly needed is, um, quoting uh, Julio Fella from uh, Queen Mary University, 
higher aggregate demand at any level of the interest rate, which points toward the need for an effective fiscal policy. You've heard tonight from the proposition that near zero interest rates have been detrimental to the world economy. On our side of the house, we see a different picture. Near zero interest rates have, been, have contributed greatly to the signs of worldwide recovery by supporting markets, other policy measures, and by signalling government policy, increasing confidence. These props remain needed for the world economy to get back on its feet. We believe the other side of the house has not sufficiently demonstrated that, negative, that the negative effects of interest rates have, signif have had significantly detrimental or indeed unresolvable uh, effects through structural reforms. We accept they have raised some arguments about negative effects of interest rates, but remember, all economic tools have benefits as well as costs, and we believe that the benefits of near zero interest rates have far outweighed the costs they've raised. Indeed, alternatives to near zero interest rates would have been disastrous. We oppose. I'd like to start off by thanking the debaters for their respective viewpoints and the way they argued, but would also, um, would also show that both, both of the teams would have maybe preferred to argue the other side, and so we commend them on the way they argued their point. I'd also like to thank the judges for, for judging um, this debate, and um, also for the audience, uh, to, I'd also thank the audience, I'd also like to thank the audience for coming, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, if you guys could just wait for around five to ten minutes um, for judges to make their decision. And, um